Well, I must say at this point, this is not deliberate uh, because we said on the gift day we were looking to get a new PC for the worship area. This just proves why, because the whole thing's frozen. We're using my laptop. If we haven't got words for communion, we've got the God as a service and we'll be absolutely fine. The enemy will not win. We will still celebrate communion. We will still worship the Lord with or without the technology. Anyway, I wasn't going to say that, but I am. I've said it. So... I imagine when Nigel started reading, uh, when you looked at Deuteronomy, you thought, oh no, Tim is going to talk about the dreaded T word. Not tax, but tithe. Sounds worse than tax, doesn't it? Tithe. To a certain extent, giving and serving is all about tithing. Two weeks ago, we explored doing and giving sacrificially when we looked at Abraham and Isaac, including when the Lord asks us to do something outrageous. For those of us at Latin Hall last weekend, we explored our identity in the Holy Spirit. We explored how to live a spirit-filled life. And I know that those of you gathered here also looked at the Holy Spirit. But the question I want to ask each of us this morning regarding the theme of giving and serving is where are you with God? Where are you with God? Where is your heart this morning? Why do I start here? Well, to give and to serve the Lord, we need to make sure that our relationship is right with him. Last week at Latin Hall, those of us gathered, spent time thinking about our priorities thinking about making sure that we put God first. And when God is first, everything else flows from that. When we do everything else and then try and fit God into our lives, it just doesn't work. And it's not to feel like a burden. But it is to start us thinking about our priorities, putting God first, and everything we do flows out of that relationship from God. Serving and giving should not be a burden, but a joy. John Goldingay speaks of this passage, an, an Old Testament scholar, regarding tithes as one of those rules that would raise problems in its implementation. Their, their rules are more like imaginative ideas than a code of laws. But what he says is essentially they are showing us what's important and how to implement them. We have, we have to work out the practicalities it would be very easy for me to stand here and say to you, give 10% of all your income to good causes, because that's what it tells us to do. But I'm not going to. I can't say that to you, because it's not something that I'm doing at the moment. And I would never ask you to do something that I'm not doing. I'm about 5 to 7%, I think, but ask me on Tuesday when I've had my tax appointment, and I'll know exactly. It is a goal that I wish to attain... But there's also an element of me thinking humanly that I need to be careful because we've got a, I've got a wife and children that we need to make sure we, ha we fulfill our needs. But anyway, the principle is there. That it's something that we, can we should try to attain, but we might not be there just yet. We should not be building up treasures here on earth that the enemy can steal or destroy. But it is about an aspect in our lives where we give back to God because we love him and he first loved us. So where is your heart this morning? All of what we do flows from our relationship with him. Perhaps we've not spent as much time with him as we usually do over the last few weeks. It should make our heart long for more of him. It's not, a, it's not supposed to be a burden, isn't this, friends? And I know whenever we start thinking about giving and serving in the church, we always say, oh, we're going to pile more stuff on. No, it's not about that at all. It's about what is God asking of you in this time. I wonder how many of us can share a testimony of when we are sacrificial in our giving and the Lord responds. I imagine there's many. It's something that doesn't work, or it shouldn't work, but it does. When we do things for the Lord, and we're giving it out of love for Him, rather than feeling obligated to, 
we see the benefits. As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 9, if we sow sparingly, we will receive sparingly. But if we are generous, we will receive generously. And in verse 7, we should give what we have decided in our heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So I'm standing here today not to make you feel guilty, not to compel you to give more, not to ask you to do it and you're going to do it reluctantly. I am standing here today saying when we get to gift day in two weeks' time, give what the Lord is asking you to give. It's between you and joy Him. It's entirely between you and Him. But do it joyfully, not reluctantly. It can sometimes feel like the church is always asking for money. But it's not. We give because we want to. If you are giving because you feel, Brendan probably closed your ears at this bit, if you're giving because you feel you ought to out of necessity, I'd rather you stopped giving to the church. I would much rather you stopped giving if you were doing it out of necessity or because you feel you ought to. I would much rather we had a group of cheerful givers giving out of the response that the Lord has asked them to do. The love of the Lord responding by returning some that is, belongs to him. Because we know that the Lord will provide for us if we give out of love for him. I told you earlier I wasn't at 10%. Yet I give to the church joyfully each month and I give to a number of other charities. And then earlier this year, Amanda and I had an unexpected bill on our caravan because the axle needed repairing. We were given a quote, we sent it off for repair and thought well, we're going to have to find it somewhere. Three days before we were due to collect that caravan, I had an email and somebody had generously given us a figure which was about £100 off what the whole caravan repair would have been. Now I don't say that to big it up because I know it's not always the case. But I'm sharing that today to give God the glory because he provided when we needed. Because we were given sacrificially and joyfully. Friends, I encourage you. God will work if we take this on board. I believe he will do the same in this church as we embark into this season of mission that I feel that we are being called to. What different trajectory that the church is going to take to start focusing on outside and getting alongside what God is already doing in the community. Because even if we've been in here, God is still out there and God is still at work. We just need to get alongside him. The Missio Dei, as it's called in, in the theological circles. Just Friday evening gone, I received a leaflet through my door, which was a Christian tract. And upon opening it, opening it, I discovered it was from Liberty House, who hire our building on a Friday and a Sunday. It wasn't asking for anything. It was just simply saying, where are you? Where's your heart? Yes, it did have the Christian message at the end. Are you going to give your life to Jesus? But there was also a little flyer in there saying, come and meet us. Come and join us. In much the same way that we do that when we put uh, postcards, put Christmas cards and Easter cards through the doors of our parish. We do that to invite people to join us. And yes, that is a huge investment. It's an investment in finance. It's an investment in time. And it's a sacrificial investment because we have to design it, which takes time, pay for it. When they arrive, we have to put them all in envelopes, put them all into bundles, and then we have to go and deliver them. When we deliver those cards, are we doing it joyfully? Are we seeing it as a service to the Lord? Or are we doing it, oh, we need to do this because it's nearly Christmas again? Every year, friends, I get asked the same question. Is it really worth it, Tim? Based on the responses I get, yes, it is. We order 3,000 cards. We send about 2,800 out. I probably only get 10 to 20 responses, if that. So in worldly terms or business terms, that's actually a real failure. But in the kingdom of God, I think that's a success. 
because for 10 to 20 that reply, there's probably another 100 to 200 that don't reply but read it. And that seed is planted in their hearts. Indeed, it was this Christmas somebody said, I've been receiving your cards for years and I finally decided to come. So when we give our time sacrificially to post those cards, it's not a wasted exercise. It's an opportunity to pray for the parish. It's an opportunity to give by giving our time. So I'm not just talking about money. In the same way, when we embark on mission this year, we don't know what seeds we are going to be planting in the lives of those whom we will encounter. We don't know what's gonna, what difference it's going to make in the community. But for many people, simply being out there and saying, come into the building, walking through the doors is a big deal for a lot of people. Walking into a church is a scary thing to do. If you've never been before, if you've not been for a while, if you've been hurt by the church, it's really hard to walk through those doors. Who knows what we will achieve in this season? But as long as we're in the right place with God, as long as we're getting alongside with what he is doing, not trying to do our own thing, serving him through the joy in our heart that he gives us, it will be a success. It's clear to see from the latest figures that we are now definitely a growing church. I went on the parish dashboard last night, not the safeguarding one, the other one, the portal, and I looked at our electoral roll figures. 2019, it's like, it's down here. 50. 2024, as you heard at the APCM two weeks ago, 69. And I know there's about six or seven more people that could go on the electoral roll next time. We are a growing church. The trajectory is positive. But it's not about the numbers. It is not about those numbers of people who we have on our roll. We could easily have over 100. But if nobody got involved, if those 100 people just came to church on a Sunday, turned up and went home, that wouldn't be a good place. That wouldn't be a church that's alive. It is so much more than the numbers on our roll. It is about our discipleship journey. It's about deepening our faith in God. It's about deepening our relationship with one another in the family. It's about serving Father, Son, and Holy Spirit joyfully. And the joke, the closer, the more you get involved with the church, the more rotors you get on. It shouldn't be that way. We should be on those rotors because we enjoy it. Because it's a gift that we possess that we want to give back to God rather than, oh, we need somebody to make the coffee today. Each and every role that people have in this church is valuable. Without people making coffee, I wouldn't function. Simply as. Without people cleaning the loos, it would be filthy. We wouldn't want to use them. Without people working behind the scenes sorting out the finances, we wouldn't be able to function because we wouldn't have accounts. Without the PCC meeting, praying, discerning, not being decision makers, but being discerners, it wouldn't, things in this church would not happen. So, where is your heart with God? How are you feeling towards God this morning as I'm talking about giving and serving? Are you thinking of him? Or are you thinking, oh, Tim, shut up because I go to give lots. I'm going to share with you something from a few years ago, which I think I've shared before. It was during the height of the pandemic. I was out on my daily walk that I was allowed. I think it was when we were allowed more than half an hour. And I walked up to the top of Warden Hill. Up at the top, I stood and looked over our community. And I saw the cross on top of our church building. It's not very big. But I saw that cross on top of this building. And it was on fire. It stood there like a beacon for the community or a radio transmitter receiving. And as I continued to watch it and pray about what it meant, a great fire from heaven came down, smashed through the building, and it rippled out into our community. When I first saw this, I was like, wow. I wonder how expensive that's going to be to repair. No, I didn't really. 
But I left it where it was because I knew that was a picture for then. It wasn't a picture for then. Because we weren't in that place where we would receive from heaven to send out and equip people outside. But having spoken to somebody last week at Letton Hall, I believe that time is now. I believe that time is now for the Holy Spirit to fall afresh on this church, for the Holy Spirit to empower each and every one of us in this church to go out and make a difference, to go out into the community, to spread the fire of heaven, to spread the the Holy Spirit so that people who do not yet know him will come to know him. I think we are ready for that. The other image I had later on was of the church doors wide open and people struggling to fit in because they had flocked to church, because they'd flocked to see Jesus, to come to know him, but they couldn't get in. That conversation last week, somebody shared a story of another church that had similar pictures from God. They started up outreach, and it was started up by the most unlikely person in that church community. The quiet person in the background that nobody thought actually really knew Jesus. Yet, they have made such a difference. They've seen loads of people come to faith. Even the police have commented that in that particular area where this church is, they have noticed a change in the young people and the youths because they are coming to know Jesus. So don't sit there and think, but I can never do that. Because if you are being called to do that, God will equip you with his Holy Spirit. He will equip you with the gifts that you need to make a difference. In whatever way that outreach looks like, whatever way that mission looks like, the Lord will provide. I believe we can have that same impact here in Bushmead. Earlier this week, I was meeting with a candidate for ordination. And I was asking him some difficult questions about what priesthood meant to him. And exploring the words of the ordinal. Which is, what's said, which is what's said over candidates in the ordination service. One of the calls is this. They are to be messengers, watchmen and stewards of the Lord. They are to teach and to admonish, to feed and provide for the family, to search for his children in the wilderness of this world's temptations and to guide them through its confusions that they may be saved through Christ forever. As we discussed what that meant, he said, I want to tell you something encouraging. And he told me the story of a man who'd started attending church 25 years ago when his wife died. His wife made him promise on her deathbed that he would go to church. He faithfully attended church, week in, week out, carrying all of the pain and the hurt at what had happened. Members of the church prayed for him regularly for those 25 years. In a couple of weeks' time, he turns 100. And a week ago, he said, I believe in Jesus. And this afternoon, Bishop Jane is going and confirming him. It brings tears to the eyes that somebody who's close to 100, let's face it, is probably a lot nearer death, not got long of it, not, probably not got many, many years left. But he has come to know Jesus after 25 years. It reminded me, we should never, ever give up praying for those in our midst. For those in our community. For those in our church family. For those in our own family. Even when it all feels like it's lost, God can still work. On Thursday, it's Ascension Day. It begins a season of thy kingdom come, the 10 days between Ascension and Pentecost. We're encouraged to pray for five people, and we join in with that ancient prayer of the church, come, Holy Spirit. I want to pray that over that period of thy kingdom come, God will not only be speaking to us individually, but he will be giving us dreams and visions of what we can do in this church to grow and to become a hope for the community and a hope for the town. If we can continue to stay focused on Jesus Christ and not be swayed by the things of the world, we will continue to see growth in this church, both in numbers and in our discipleship, 
because it is Jesus who grows his church. If we continue to stay focused on Jesus Christ and we remain secure in our faith, we can be ready for whatever is to come, whether that be in the world, the nation, or the church. I believe, friends, this year that call for thy kingdom come is more powerful and poignant than ever before. We are in a, seeing a world that is waiting with bated breath on the out of for war. We are seeing our nation that's got things so, so wrong. We are seeing the cost of living that is so high. We are seeing that people are struggling. Come, Holy Spirit. This is a time when the Lord is calling his church to listen and to hear what the Spirit is saying. It all begins by making sure our hearts are turned back towards the Lord. One of the ways we can show this is by our sacrificial and joyful waving, whether it's time, money, or talents. One of the ways we can show it is to serve one another as the family of God by being open and attentive to what the Spirit is saying. Tithing, which is where we began with the reading from Deuteronomy, is something that we're called to do. It's about supporting and caring for those who are not self-sufficient for whatever reason. The system of tithing from those days enabled both groups to learn and understand their continual dependence on God. In the modern days that we live, it's all too easy to forget we have to depend on God. We go to the supermarket, we buy the food we want, we receive our salary or stipend for the work we do, we receive our pension if we're retired. But we forget that there are so many more people out there who do not have that, who are struggling who can't afford to put food on the table, who have to use the food bank, who can't afford to heat their houses, hopefully not at the moment while the weather's so nice, but you get the point. The system of tithing reminds us that not everyone has regular means of subsistence. It reminds us that whatever we have belongs to the Lord. And if we are willing to give, those who have needs will find them met, because that's how God's economy works. Those that have more give for those that have less. And then both, Receive the blessing of God. So if we are wondering where God is in the world at the moment, perhaps rather than crying out, God, where are you? Our first thought should be, God, how is my heart towards you? Have we got him at the forefront of all that we do? In this season, as we turn our attention outwards, as we look to seek the lost and guide them through the temptations of this world, when we give, it's not to keep the church afloat. It's to give thanks to God, to support the community, so that we can continue to experience his blessing. So where is your heart this morning? Where is your relationship with God? What do you need to do before you leave this building today? Amen.